So uh, I have a feeling that uh, a lot of people here are really excited about machine learning. And uh, I think that excitement is not unreasonable. Um, machine learning has, has shown its potential before. Uh, it has completely revo revolutionized computer vision. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a revolution in image compression, uh, but we've already seen that ML has made its way into existing compression methods. We've heard uh, talks about predict, uh, to, um, methods to predict mode decisions to speed up the encoder. Uh, there are learned intra-prediction methods. There are learned in-loop filters, learned upscaling filters. Um, but what I want to focus on today is a bit more radical. Um, I want to talk about image compression methods that are learned end-to-end. -to -end. And we've also seen some examples of that in the special session this morning. Um, I think it's really a topic worth thinking about, uh, even though the complexity may still be quite high. Um, although uh, I heard about the CPU decade just a minute ago, and that made me feel a bit more comfortable. <laughs> so um, I'm interested in, in just how good compression can get if we, if we try to fully exploit the, the potential of these techniques. And uh, uh, let me give you an example of the kind of results uh, that you can expect from, from learned image compression. So, so when we apply a modern compression method to an image like this, and, and when we target a very low bitrate, then we're going to see some artifacts. Uh, so here's HEVC intra. The target bitrate is about 0 0.1 bits per pixel. And if you look closely, you can uh, actually identify many of the components that are inside HEVC intra. So for example, if you take a look at the sky, you can see that there's staircasing. So and that basically tells you there is some sort of a block partitioning going on. Um, if you look at some of the uh, prominent edges in the picture, then you can see ringing. Uh, and that basically gives away that you have some sort of frequency transform. Uh, and this kind of linear transform also uh, causes some structural uh, distortions that can sometimes completely alter the, the appearance of, for instance, of objects like this boat up here. Um, if you look at some of the, some of the more organic shapes, like the, uh, the bushes down here, then uh, you can actually see that there's uh, directional prediction going on because it tends to force these edges into, into sort of easier to be coded shapes. Um, another difficulty that uh, you will find in, in existing methods is um, if you want to do per more perceptual rate allocation, uh, that can be quite hard to do. And for, for instance here, the system doesn't really allocate enough bits to the texture in the background. So you have a lot of flattened texture uh, up here. So all of these coding tools are revealed because they have been independently developed and optimized. And then, and then they've been joined together in, in kind of a manual process that happens at the standardization committees. In a compression method that's optimized end to end, um, artifacts like that don't really have to happen. Uh, and not only that, if you, if you set, up, set it up the right way, uh, an end-to-end -end trained method uh, will also figure out automatically how to do the rate allocation in an optimized way, basically just based on the distortion metric that you optimize it for. Here's the image coded to the same bitrate with an end-to-end -end trained method. So you can see there's no staircasing. Uh, the, Edges here are crisp. There's no ringing. Um, boat pretty much looks still like a boat. It might uh, lose some details. Uh, the bushes look uh, more natural. And also, the method learned to shift some of the bits into the, into the background. So here's another close-up comparison. Again, uh, the end-to-end -end trained method produces somewhat more pleasant artifacts uh, that tend to keep the image structure intact more. Um, here's another good example uh, for learned rate allocation. So this is HEVC intra, and uh, this is an end-to-end -end trained method. So it, it pushes a, a lot more uh, bits into this texture here. And this is the same bit rate. Another example, uh, this is HEVC intra. Um, you take a look at the, the rose petals, for example. Uh, 
you can see that the reconstructions have a more natural sort of image, natural image-like um, uh, look, even though they are clearly missing some details. One more example, uh, take a look at the background. So if you look up here, you have a lot of these uh, directional prediction artifacts, which may make the clouds look kind of unnatural. Uh, you have a lot of transform artifacts here. And if you look at the end-to-end -end train method, uh, it all looks more natural, although we might lose some details down here. So if I go back, you can see that there is a, a bit of detail loss, but overall you have sort of a more balanced uh, visual impression. So uh, the field of learned compression is already too big to be covered in, in detail in less than an hour. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with an introduction into the kinds of models that, that I'm most familiar with. And I'm, I'm going to make some connections with uh, other existing work. Uh, I'm going to start with something fairly simple, transform coding. Uh, and I'm going to explain how we can actually use neural networks to extend it from linear to nonlinear transforms. Uh, then I'm going to relate uh, nonlinear transform coding to representation learning, which is uh, a much wider concept and uh, which we can use as a source of inspiration for, for better learned compression methods. Third, I'm going to try to anticipate some questions that uh, you might have if you are not familiar with this, um, this field. And uh, last, I want to update you on what happened last week at the, at the first challenge on learned image compression. Maybe get some water. I only have like this much left. Okay. Um, let's take a look at, at JPEG as a, a stand-in for a simple transform coder. Uh, so we have an image called X, uh, which is subjected to a DCT transform. That gives us the transform coefficients, which I'm calling y here. Uh, these are quantized, typically with a non-uniform quantizer. And once they are discrete, we can actually entropy code and decode them. Uh, and we can advantage, take advantage of some statistical relationships there. Uh, we can use run length encoding, zigzag scan, Huffman code, etc. So I'm going to skip over a couple of important details here, uh, just to keep it simple. The main point is that we'll end up with a set of perturbed coefficients, um, which I'm calling y hat. And uh, these are then fed through the uh, inverse transform. Oh, thank you. Uh, and that gives us the reconstructed image uh, x hat. And then we, then we can basically measure the distortion with a metric of our choice. So what, what ends up defining this uh, method is, uh, on the one hand, the distortion, and on the other hand, the rates. So why do we use the DCT or similar transforms? Uh, well, we can go all the way back to the paper proposing it in 1974. Uh, the authors there measured the rate distortion performance of the DCT. Um, and they note that it, it's almost as good as the KLT. But we can compute it much faster. So that explains why it has been so successful and why we're still using transforms that are similar. What's interesting here is, uh, are the assumptions that the authors base their analysis on. So um, the authors say that in the paper that it's really true only for AR1 signals or, or for Gaussian signals. Uh, but another assumption that's not really even mentioned in the paper is that uh, they're looking for a linear transform. So the KLT is the best linear transform. And we can't really blame them for omitting that assumption because in 1974, well, linear transforms were basically all you could do. Uh, in general, though, uh, when we do image compression, uh, the signal is, is not Gaussian. It's highly non-Gaussian. And the rate distortion optimal transform is uh, very likely not linear. Uh, and this is where A and Ns come in. Artificial neural networks are generic function approximators. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, but training of large ANNs uh, has been mostly infeasible until very recently. And now with uh, modern hardware, it's become very easy to actually obtain good approximations uh, for arbitrary input-output relationships. 
so generally, an ANN is a mapping from an input vector x to an output vector y, uh, and it consists of uh, linear transforms uh, that alternate with nonlinear transforms. And then the, the weights of these linear transforms uh, make up the parameters of the network. Uh, so I'm calling those data here. <clears throat> the crucial thing here to realize is that uh, we can use these universal function approximators to approximate the optimal R, uh, rate distortion, uh, the rate distortion optimal transform, even if they're nonlinear. So, so for the next few, few slides, I want to talk about a, a, a relatively simple model, which I like to call nonlinear transform coding. It's basically what it sounds like it is. Uh, we basically just replace the neural net, uh, the linear transforms with ANNs. And to keep things simple, we're going to use a uniform quantizer and a very simple arithmetic coder, which basically just assumes that all the elements are independent. So there's no context, there's no adaptivity. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. The problem is, again, this uh, system has a lot of parameters. And the arithmetic coder, so the arithmetic coder has parameters. Uh, in that it has, uh, it has to model a probability distribution, which we can use to generate the tables for the arithmetic coder. And the neural networks uh, have parameters in the weights, and quite a lot of them. So if we don't know what the parameters are, we can't really use it. Uh, we have to use uh, some, some method to actually get these parameters. And that's where the machine learning comes in. Uh, and fortunately, machine learning gives us all the tools to optimize the system to find good parameters, not necessarily the optimal ones, but very good ones. And I'm calling this here the machine learning treatment because this is uh, a set of tools that has, been, has become really uh, popular recently. So, so what do we do? Um, first of all, we need to know what we want to optimize. We need to have a loss function. And in, in image compression, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, any lossy compression method wants to uh, minimize its rate distortion cost. Uh, so we can write the rate simply as the uh, entropy of the coefficient distribution. So that's going to be the expected value over all images uh, of the negative logarithm of the uh, coefficient distribution. Uh, and we can write the squared error also with an expectation over all images. And uh, then, of course, we will have to trade these things off. Um, and for simplicity here, I'm just going to assume we're going to target one particular trade-off. So we have a, a constant lambda uh, just sitting here being multiplied with the distortion. And we, we add it all up. And now we would like to minimize this. Um, if we actually write this out in, ex in its expli explicit form, it becomes quite unwieldy. So you, you see that it becomes a rather nasty expression. It has all the parameters sprinkled inside of it. And now we have to fi find a way to minimize this. Um, so one standard way of approaching this, uh, if you have these expectations there, is to use stochastic gradient descent. Uh, stochastic gradient descent basically um, replaces the expectation with uh, an approximation, uh, which is just a mean over a, a small number of images. So you're, and this is called a batch. So we take a batch of images uh, and we average the loss function over these, these images. So that's good because we don't have to evaluate any integrals to compute that expectation. Um, the other thing we do is we take the derivative of that expectation and pull it inside of the sum. So, so now it looks a lot more feasible, but we still have um, a rather unwieldy um, derivative here to work out. And that's where um, all these automatic differentiation frameworks come in, like TensorFlow. So that uh, software basically um, lets us write down these expressions in symbolic form, and it automatically computes the derivatives for us so we don't have to work them, them out manually. Um, so this might seem like we can now actually uh, find parameters of the system. But we've neglected one thing, 
uh, it turns out that we've overlooked that there is actually a quantization function in here. And because the quantizer is essentially uh, a step function, in the best case, we'll get zero derivatives. And uh, if we're really unlucky, we will get infinite derivatives. And uh, so this pretty much kills gradient descent. And the solution that I like to use to fix this problem is to pretend that uh, during training um, that there's no quantizer and instead we, we're going to replace it with adding uniform noise. So we'll do this during training and then when we actually use the system we're just going to quantize it uh, as usual. Uh, this has the interesting effect that the probability distribution of the coefficients uh, is going to change. Um, so if you do uniform quantization and let's say the coefficients here have a Laplace distribution, then you would get, um, the, then the quantized coefficients would have a distribution like these, uh, this train of delta functions. And that's because uh, you basically take all the probability mass that's inside a bin and you map it to, to this one, one value. When instead we add uniform noise, uh, we will get a distribution that looks like this. So what this basically does is it interpolates the uh, probability mass function of the quantized coefficients um, and it's, it's kind of like a continuous relaxation. So the nice property of this is that we can during training, we can uh, use some parametric model to, um, to uh, track these um, continuous distributions. And then when we want to use it for, for actual compression, we just have to evaluate the function at the integer values. And that gives <coughs> us the probability mass function, which in turn uh, allows us to construct the arithmetic coding table. Okay, so uh, here is uh, the result of me applying this to a very simple toy example. Um, in linear transform coding, it might not make, make much sense to, uh, to do a compression of a scalar variable. Uh, in nonlinear transform coding, that actually does make sense. So what I did here was to, uh, to instead of compressing images, I'm compressing a Laplacian source distribution. And this is just a scalar distribution. So um, I design a very small neural network that just takes one scalar as an input. It has a, a handful of neurons and then it outputs another scalar. And what you see in this uh, graph here is uh, for once you have the source distribution. Uh, it's the blue line. And then you have the, um, these vertical lines here uh, indicate um, the boundaries of where in the transform domain uh, one, uh, one value flips over into the next integer value. The, um, the stalks in here represent the points that you get when you take an integer value in the transform domain and map it back into the data space. So what you can see here is basically that this nonlinear transform coder acts like a uh, a non-uniform quantizer. And what's, what's very nice and encouraging is that um, it actually figures out that it should use a dead zone. And it also puts the representers near the conditional mean within each bin. Uh, so these are two properties that we know will help with uh, compressing a source like this. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that we didn't put that in there. So the, the system learned to do that just based on the getting the samples from the Laplacian distribution during training. So now we can go uh, a, a step up and we can extend this uh, thing to two dimensions. So uh, to make it more interesting, uh, what I did here was construct a probability density that, that uh, looks like a banana. Um, and I applied the same te technique to, um, to this distribution, um, but I constrained the transforms to be linear. So what you can see here is that when you, when you uh, constrain it to be a linear transform, that you're basically stuck with a lattice quantizer. Um, still, the, the system tries to sort of 
perform optimally under this constraint. So what it, what it figures out to do is that it's going to align the, the lattice with the sort of the, the mm. fundamental directions of the banana, if you will. So it, it's trying to do its best to adapt to the source distribution. And this is what you get when you, re, re, when you lift that constraint. So now I'm, I'm going back to uh, uh, using a very small neural network instead of the linear transform. So uh, two things happen here. Uh, one thing is that the, the cost, the rate plus lambda times distortion cost, went down from 6.9 to about 6. So it's gotten uh, quite a bit better at compressing the source. The other thing that you can see is that it's a lot more flexible. It has now um, adapted much more to the data distribution. Um, you can see that it's still a lattice, but the lattice is warped. It's, uh, it's almost like it shrink-wrapped the banana. Now we can compare this to uh, a rate-constraint vector quantizer. And uh, this is a rate-constraint vector quantizer that I optimized for this source distribution. And that's pretty much, uh, this is pretty much the best you can hope to get. So um, you can see here that it's actually not that much better. So it just went from 5.97 to 5.95. <clears throat> so in conclusion, the nonlinear transform coder is not necessarily optimal. Uh, but because it is so much more flexible, it can actually approach the optimum um, uh, quite a bit better. So now let's get to images. Um, for coding images, uh, we use quite a bit bigger neural networks. And instead of using general linear transforms, we use convolutions. For the results that I'm showing next, we also use the GDN linearity that I discussed this morning. And uh, I want to point out for VN that we're not using 1,000 layers, we're just using three. So it's, it's uh, not quite as bad as you might think. <clears throat> uh, so here I'm going to show you some results for this particular image and uh, at one particular target bitrate. Uh, but for Three different compression methods, one for JPEG and for JPEG 2000 and for this nonlinear transform coder. Um, note that none of these methods are really state of the art in any way. Uh, and not even the nonlinear one. So this is an older model. Uh, I just want to compare the basically the three different transforms. Here's JPEG. Um, should look familiar. You get the typical block artifacts. Um, then you have JPEG 2000. Um, that's an orthogonal wavelet, so you get the typical ringing about the, around the object boundaries. Uh, you get some artifacts because we're assuming that the wavelet is separable, so diagonal lines are a little bit harder. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is the nonlinear transform. You can see that the image is lacking a lot of detail, uh, but again, it's, it manages to make the image look relatively natural. Uh, it comes out look, looking natural, but uh, a lot more smooth than, than would be than normal. Here's a close-up. Um, what's quite nice is how the model seems to learn something about object boundaries. So if you look up here, uh, it's not just throwing out linear uh, frequency components, because the edges here are about as sharp as, as over here. So it's uh, roughly the same. Um, for some reason, it learned to, to simplify the shape instead. And that seems to be a property of all of these, all of, all of these types of uh, nonlinear transforms. <coughs> okay, so now we just generalize linear transform coding to nonlinear transforms. And what we'll see next is how we can generalize it even further to something that I call representation learning. Here's a definition of representation learning. It says, learned representations aim to make it easier to extract useful information when building classifiers or other predictors. 
In the case of probabilistic models, a good representation is often one that captures underlying explanatory factors of the observed input. So as you can see, uh, representation learning, there isn't really a clear definition of it. Uh, but in general, the goal is to find an alternative representation of the data, in this case, images. If you aim to classify images, then, for example, you might want to have a representation where the classes are nicely separated. If you want to do compression, then you might want to find a representation that's decorrelated, and so on. Uh, one concept that has been around for decades in representation learning is the autoencoder. It goes all the way back to the 1980s uh, when, when Jeff Hinton and others explored all kinds of variations of it. Uh, but today, an autoencoder is generally understood to do dimensionality reduction. Uh, so it's quite similar to transform coding, except that the transforms were always assumed to be nonlinear, and we don't have any entropy coding or probabilistic modeling in the latent space. <clears throat> Instead, you have the goal of just reducing dimensionality. So uh, all you do is make sure that uh, you set it up so that the, uh, the, the transformed vector has a, has a smaller dimensionality than your input. And that means that in the, uh, in the loss function, all you have is the distortion term. There's also somewhat different terminology. Um, one thing is that they call the analysis transform the encoder and the synthesis transform the decoder. Um, the transform domain may be called the latent space. Um, sometimes it's called the bottleneck, which uh, makes sense if you think about it in terms of dimensionality reduction. A more recent uh, concept is the variational autoencoder. Uh, that's a model that combines ideas from the autoencoder with variational Bayesian inference. Uh, or if you will, uh, it's like it augments the autoencoder with probabilistic, um, uh, with, a, with a probabilistic setting. If you go in one direction from the latent space to the data space, um, then you have a Bayesian generative model. Um, so basically you're assuming that your latents are distributed according to some prior, um, P of Y. Um, and then the data is assumed to follow a distribution uh, that is conditioned on that, uh, on that representation. And typically it's conditioned on a transformation of the latent space within, with a neural network. If you go in the other direction, and this is where the, where the uh, innovation of the variational autoencoder comes in, you have an approximate posterior, which has a closed form. So, uh, you're essentially imposing that the latent space here is, is modeled as a conditional distribution um, which is structured in the same way. So the, the difference to a traditional um, Bayesian generative model is that you can do relatively cheap uh, approximate inference once you've trained the system. If this is a little bit too abstract, then uh, you, you can consider uh, ICA. So independent compon component analysis um, is essentially a subset of this variational autoencoder. Uh, in, in ICA, you typically have a mixture of, um, say, audio sources that are assumed to be independent. So you have a factorial distribution. And then uh, the generative model says you are mixing these sources with a mixing matrix, and you're actually observing uh, this mixture with some additive noise. Once you've figured out what your mixing matrix is, then you can actually go, in, go the inverse way, and you can just invert the matrix, and you can figure out what your original sources are. Uh, so the variational autoencoder is like a generalization of this type of model, except that maybe uh, these, this, these mixtures, these sources, actually don't really have to correspond to any real source. Now, it turns out that the rate distortion optimization problem with uh, nonlinear transform coding is a very close cousin of the variational autoencoder. Uh, and you can see, see this by looking at the loss function. So here we have the, the rate distortion loss function from before. And uh, the crucial point is you could take this distortion 
here. Um, so in this case, the squared error, and you can reinterpret it as uh, a Gaussian. You, you just need to add some or, or drop some additive constants that correspond to the normalizer of the distribution, and you can basically write it as the negative log of a Gaussian, uh, where the mean comes from the transformed latents. And with that, you have basically written the, uh, the data um, as, uh, as modeled by a conditional distribution. And so if you write it even more general, you'll, you'll see that you have uh, now two logarithmic terms. One is uh, P of Y, and then the other one is P of, P of X given Y. And that's basically the loss function of a Bayesian generative model. So I simplified a bit here because to a variational order encoder, you have some more terms that correspond to the approximate posterior. Uh, but the basic intuition here is that um, the connection between the rate distortion loss function um, and the variational order encoder is that the distortion is analogous to the negative log likelihood. So the, we've already seen this morning that there are, all, uh, that there are uh, many other probabilistic representations and uh, you could use many of those in the same way or in, in, in other ways to uh, construct compression models. Um, we've seen the mixtures of experts, we've seen uh, RBMs, we've seen uh, GANs, uh, for instance, and a lot of these models um, can even be combined. So it's, it's very interesting to look into this space and see what, what kind of other models could be used um, to inspire new compression methods. Okay, so uh, probably 95% of you are probably uh, thinking, how good is learned image compression? I want the numbers. Give me the numbers. Okay, so at, at the moment, uh, the state-of-the-art learned image compression method is one of our papers that we published earlier this year at ICLR. Uh, it's, it's basically, um, what's, what's going on is basically it extends the autoencoder um, the variation autoencoder with a hyperprior. So it, it turns the, um, the simple variation autoencoder into a hierarchical Bayesian model. And if you, if you turn this into compression lingo, uh, what we're basically doing is uh, we're in improving the entropy model of the autoencoder by sending some side information. So now we have, some, we have a, basically a second bit stream here. Um, so we're, we're first sending the second bit stream then we're using it to construct the entropy coder, and then we send the actual representation. And there, again, you can, you can keep up the analogy between variational autoencoders and uh, compression uh, methods here. And with this technique, we can get a significant performance boost. So as you can see, the, the simple nonlinear transform coder, which is the, uh, the purple line here, factorized prior, is just a bit better than JPEG 2000, which is the green line. Um, and with the, with the hyperprime model, we can actually uh, jump a, quite a bit up, and now we're almost as good as HEVC uh, intra. Um, this is a big step, uh, and I hope that we can uh, you know, make, keep making these big steps. Um, it's, actually quite surprising that we got this, this good because we only used, uh, you know, we, we did this whole development in, in the time of maybe two years. Um, and it's developed from scratch. So, so this is PSNR. Um, so far, so good. But uh, what about other metrics? Um, well, MSSM is another popular metric. And if you evaluate that same model, and again with HEVC intra, uh, you see that, surprisingly, we're actually um, basically just as good as HEVC intra. It's surprising because we actually optimize the system to be good at mean squared error. Um, so it's, it's kind of weird that we're getting better results in MSSM compared to HEVC. But that also leads to another interesting uh, observation because we can, we can actually take the, the model and optimize it directly for MSSM. 
And that's, that's not very hard because all we have to do is take the loss function and replace the mean squared error part with an MSS part. So we keep this, the model exactly the same. All we, all we do is switch out the loss function. And that gets us up here. Um, as far as I know, that's the best result that uh, anyone has ever gotten in terms of MSSM on this data set. So the nice thing about learned image compression um, in, in this, um, or, or this flavor of learned in image compression is that we can directly optimize for any metric. Uh, all we have to have is that it's differentiable. And then there's actually no surprise here. I mean, if we directly optimize for it, then we would expect to be better. Okay, so uh, again, 95% of you are probably going to think, well, which one actually looks better? And that's an excellent question. And uh, we, have, we, we may not have um, direct uh, subjective tests on that, but we have some interesting observations. So this is a reconstructed image from the model that was uh, optimized for squared error at a uh, fairly low bitrate again. And then if I can switch over to the one that was optimized for MSSM. I hope you can see a difference on this projector. Um, so this is again the same model, we just switched out the metric that we optimized for. If I go back and forth a little bit, um, you should be able to see that the MSSM optimized model puts quite, quite a bit more detail into the face and the sweater. And the difference is really just up to rate allocation. Um, and that's, that's basically how you get rate allocation in learned compression models. You, you, you change the distortion metric. And the model will try to do better at that distortion metric by pushing bits around. And in this case, um, what the model did was it allowed a tone shift to happen in the background and instead used the, the bits in the face and in the sweater. So I can go back and you'll see that there is a tone shift. And this kind of change is actually, it's actually quite good. I mean, this, this works for a lot of images. Um, however, there are also some cases where, it, where it's not doing what we want. Um, so in this image, um, you should be able to see that, again, MSSM tends to put more bits into textures. So if I switch back and forth, you should see that there's more detail in the grass if I go to MSSM. The problem is where the bits are taken away from. And you might see that it's actually taking away the bits from the text. And uh, can't really blame the model for it, uh, because for humans, text is special, right? We, we like to read things. Um, it has semantic meaning. And so for us, the text is really important. And in this particular image, we would not want to move more bits into the texture. So uh, again, it's, it's really nice that we can now really directly optimize for different distortion metrics. Uh, but now it puts the burden on the distortion metric, right? Now we need a distortion metric that is actually uh, doing what we want. All right, uh, but surely these methods must be computationally expensive. Well, first of all, don't call me Shirley. And second, yes, they are somewhat expensive. Many of the published methods are relatively slow. So uh, the state-of-the-art model that I just presented is, uh, is taking about 330 milliseconds to encode or decode a 512 by 768 pixel image on a desktop CPU. And uh, we've heard this morning there's been a lot of work on making ANNs faster, including pruning units and uh, reducing precision. Um, but many of these techniques don't perform as well on compression networks. So uh, a lot more research is needed in that space. And uh, we also can't really take the easy way out and run these models in the cloud because that would kind of defeat the purpose of compression. But um, in general, we are seeing more GPUs, accelerators uh, becoming available in mobile devices even. Uh, so. We can hope that time here works in our favor and that um, uh, in some time in the future we will have more access to these um, 
optimized devices so that we can actually uh, run these things in practice. And here's some data that shows that if you do have access to a GPU, uh, encoding and decoding times can actually be quite reasonable. Um, so this is a paper that was published uh, last year by a startup called Wave One. Um, they're now not anymore the state of the art in terms of compression efficiency, but uh, you can see that they did a pretty good job at optimizing their system for speed. Uh, so they report that they can basically run their encoder or decoder uh, in under 20 milliseconds um, on an image like this uh, on a medium range gaming GPU. Uh, and that figure includes the entropy coding. So, so we have some evidence that these models can run in practice, uh, but of course there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Cool, hey, my retrieval, classification, segmentation, and so on algorithm also uses ANNs. What's up with that? So there are some benefits to uh, the autoencoder, nonlinear transform coding style setup. For instance, um, it's, it's pretty easy to train a classifier or a segmentation algorithm uh, directly from the latent space instead of having to decode the image first. And this study here compares floating point operations uh, directly with uh, classification or segmentation accuracy. And they basically find that, um, well, you can save some computational complexity if you, if you run your classifier directly from the compressed domain. We can even take this a little bit further. For, uh, for some applications, it could actually be interesting to not compress the image itself, but just compress enough data so that you can analyze the image. Uh, for example, in image retrieval ap applications, um, you might want to just store a compressed feature representation and then use that uh, to run a retrieval algorithm. So in this study, we basically train a neural network um, to classify images. So you go from data space to the class labels. Um, but instead of going straight there, we go through an intermediate representation. And this um, uh, representation, again, is compressed. Um, so I call this here the entropy bottleneck, but essentially uh, we're doing the same thing as in the nonlinear transform coding model. <clears throat> so once we're in the intermediate representation and we've compressed it, decompressed it, then we actually go to the class labels. And this whole system is trained jointly or end-to-end. Um, and this time we don't have a rate uh, distortion trade-off, but we have a rate accuracy trade-off. And it turns out that this saves an enormous amount of space. Um, so previously when you want, want to store intermediate features like this, um, you would store them in floating point format. And uh, for example, for the ImageNet validation data set, you would need around 38 gigabytes to store uh, all these features. You can do something simple, like compress it with gzip, uh, then you go down to seven gigabytes. <clears throat> but um, when we actually allow this model uh, to train a specialized compressed representation for these features, you can bring it down to 850 gigabytes, uh, megabytes, sorry, and you have the same ac uh, classification accuracy. Okay, I've seen all these fabulous images synthesized by neural networks. Can compression models do that too? So if you've seen uh, really convincing uh, synthesized images, uh, chances are that these came from a generative adversarial network. And we've seen, some, we've seen a talk this morning about uh, this, this technique. Um, so a GAN is essentially uh, another type of model where uh, in a nutshell what happens is that you uh, you sample from a random vector and you call this your latent representation and then there's a, uh, a generator network that takes this latent representation and transforms it into an image. And the way this uh, generator network is trained is that it's basically pitted against uh, another network which is called the discriminator. So the discriminator randomly receives uh, either an image from the training set or it receives an image that was generated uh, by, the, by the other network. And then its job is to figure out which one of it it is. So now you have two networks fighting against each other. And the ultimate goal of this is to uh, reach a sort of equilibrium so that 
the generator is trained up to producing realistic looking images. <clears throat> so this is an implicit probability model. You can sample from it, but you cannot really evaluate the likelihood or, or you can even not go from an image to the latent representation. So what we saw in the paper this morning um, was that we, we can create a hybrid kind of model where we have this autoencoder style setup, um, but now we, we use a discriminator network to actually try and make the reconstructed images more plausible. Note that training a model like this is not quite straightforward. So um, typically we have, um, or typically these GAN losses are are unstable. So uh, what people do in practice is they add a lot more constraints uh, into uh, into these these models. And during the training, you have other you have another squared loss or you have an MSSM loss and so on. And there's uh, other heuristics that people use to make these models train in practice. But when it works, um, then the results can be quite stunning. And I have uh, one result here that I want to show you. Um, this is a fairly recent paper which just appeared on Archive. Um, and what the authors did was basically use this kind of setup. And they applied this uh, model to a narrower domain of images. So in this case, they used uh, video, uh, well, single frames of a video of street scenes. Uh, so in this case, this is an HEVC intra-coded um, version of this image. Uh, it's very low bit rate, it's 2.5 kilobytes roughly. And here's the same image that's compressed uh, with that GAN based method. And you can see uh, directly that there's a lot more detail in this image. So let me go back and forth again. You see that there's uh, much more detail in the trees, there's much more detail in the, uh, in the buildings. Uh, you even have the Mercedes Benz star down here. Um, so looks uh, a lot more pleasing, looks like a, lo a lot more plausible as an actual image. But now if I want to compare this to the original, then you actually see that it looks quite different. So now you get, um, you get also a lot more details, but they're very different from the original. So you can see that the foliage changes uh, in the trees, um, the texture on the buildings changes, um, you can't really see it in this image, but sometimes cars change colors. Uh, all kinds of things happen. So it's, it's a really interesting result. Um, and maybe one key to getting these really realistic uh, looking images is that um, it's easier for the model to uh, generate realistic images if you constrain the domain of the images. So if you, uh, if you really only show it images that have these street scenes, and in particular, if there's always this Mercedes-Benz star down here, then it knows that it has to generate uh, these details right there. So it's, it's, um, it's, it may be much easier to train models on narrow domain data than on general images. And exactly how well this generalizes to general images is still being debated in the machine learning community. So as you can see, there are some exciting first results uh, in this new field, and, but a lot of work still needs to be done. Um, there's still a lot of room for improvement in the probabilistic models themselves, so we just plain need to get better compression. Um, we've seen that better quality metrics are essential. Uh, a lot more work is necessary to uh, move this out of the academic regime and uh, integrate the methods better with hardware, uh, like Vivian is already doing, basically, um, uh, just so that we can actually deploy it. We also really need to worry about reducing the storage costs for the model parameters, because these are, uh, we have a lot of parameters in these models. Uh, there's some first results that, uh, that try to do video. Um, there's work regarding progressive, scalable compression models. Um, we can, of course, explore more data sets. So there's nothing in here that says you have to apply this to images. We can apply it to audio. We can apply it to audiovisual data, whatever. <clears throat> and uh, there's even some work that explores other types of channels. 
um, or do joint source channel coding. And I think that's, so I want to tell you about a project that I think is really fun. Um, this is a paper from a group at UC Berkeley, uh, which they presented uh, earlier this year on DC, at DCC. Uh, and what they've been doing is they, they've been looking at these devices called phase change memory. Uh, so these devices have some advantages over flash. <coughs> they're, you know, they're, they use less power, they're faster, they last longer. Um, and how this uh, device basically works is that you apply a voltage um, and then uh, you measure a resistance out of that uh, device. And the, the thing is that if, depending on what voltage you apply, you get a different resistance distribution. Uh, so this is a highly nonlinear analog channel. Um, and that means that standard error correcting codes can't really be used because they, use, they assume you know, Gaussian channels and so on. But because this is a probabilistic relationship um, and you know, we're already using probabilistic models to, to design a compression method, we can basically integrate this seamlessly. So it's actually even easier to do this than uh, to do um, a quantization and arithmetic coding because we don't have to deal with um, the discretization aspect of it. So what they basically do is they just replace the quantization and the arithmetic coding with a probabilistic model of the voltage resistance relationship. Um, the results currently aren't anything to write home about, but uh, they have some encouraging first results where they show that you know, they can do better than JPEG um, with a sort of standard uh, channel code. Okay, so if you, if you think now that you maybe want to try some, some of this stuff out, um, we have just started to release some source code in, uh, uh, on GitHub, um, and we're calling it the TensorFlow Compression Library. Uh, so this is a project uh, from my team at Google. And uh, you, can, you can download it, and you can train your own ML models. Um, uh, you can train your own nonlinear transform coder, or you can train other types of machine learning models that have data compression built in. Uh, we're going to update this in the future, and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to make some additions. Um, it's also completely open source, so if you want to contribute, you're very, very welcome. Um, if you want the announcements when we, whenever we release new code, then there's, a, there's also a Google group that you can subscribe to. Okay. So uh, now some words about um, Click, uh, our challenge on learned image compression last week at CVPR. Um, so the challenge was organized by uh, a mixed team of people from Google, from Twitter, and from ETH Zürich. Uh, and we've, we've all put in a lot of work uh, to make this happen. We were very honored with uh, four excellent speakers. Um, we're really glad that they all came and uh, agreed to speak. Okay, so why, why would we make an image compression challenge um, just for this? Well, uh, basically, as I hope I've convinced you, we've seen some really encouraging results and we, we really want to explore this direction further. Um, we want to encourage both machine learning and compression researchers to work in this field. We want to introduce compression to machine learning people. We want to introduce comp uh, machine learning to compression people. And in particular, we want to be sure that certain caveats of compression are taken care of. Uh, so for example, we want to make sure that there is no information leakage from encoder to decoder. Uh, we want to make sure that um, uh, bit streams can always be decoded. Um, and on top of that, uh, in machine learning, you typically train on fairly small images, and uh, you tend to ignore the boundary handling of convolutions and so on. Uh, and that's not really a good idea in image compression. So we need um, we need some standard to um, to evaluate uh, these things in the same way. So how did the challenge proceed? Um, basically, we released a set of images that can be used for training. Um, then the participants had some time, uh, 
couple of months uh, to train their models, to tune their <coughs> methods so that they hit uh, 0.15 BPP, which was the target bit rate for this challenge. Um, and then after a few months, we released a test set. And uh, so we did not ask participants to send us their reconstructions because that would have allowed them to cheat. So what we asked them to do was to send us the image decoders and the compressed versions of their images. And then we ran the decoders on isolated environments so that there was no way of cheating. And then we used the decoded images for evaluation. Here's a breakdown on what kind of methods were submitted. Um, we got a lot of submissions uh, where people used existing codecs, so HEVC, et cetera. And then they uh, developed some post-processing so maybe uh, super resolu resolution or artifact removal kind of um, models. Uh, the second chunk of images uh, were true end-to-end -end, uh, train methods. And then we also had, um, I think, one traditional method uh, and one traditional method that included a couple of learned coding tools. For the evaluation, uh, we first computed uh, PSNR and we computed MSSIM. And then the top uh, methods in both metrics were selected to uh, send for subjective testing. Uh, there we had 17 human raters per image. Um, and those raters had five choices for scores. Um, each image was shown for two seconds and then there was a short break followed by the scoring. Here's an interesting statistic. Um, these are the decoding times versus the decoder sizes in megabytes. And uh, this is where HEVC intra is. So uh, you can see that there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, the largest decoder was 190 megabytes uh, big. And the longest time for decoding the test set was 61 hours. So I'm, it's not quite a CPU week or a CPU decade. So that's, uh, that's, that's good, I hope. Uh, but we, we no, uh, no doubt we have to do a lot better than this. There were five awards. Uh, the first two, um, best MSISIM and best MOS, uh, both went to a team which uh, basically built on top of the hyper prior model that I talked about earlier. So this was an end-to-end -end trained method. The award for the best PSNR uh, actually went to a traditional method with some learned cooling tools inside of it. Then the fastest method among the top five um, went to a traditional method. And then we had another award for a method which got pretty good results in both PSNR and MOS. And that one used HEVC intra with a learned post-processing network. So in summary, we had 31 submissions uh, to the challenge. We had 14 challenge track papers, nine papers that did not have a challenge submission. Uh, there were a number of methods that were better than HEVC intra at this target bit rate. And the MOS and MSSIM uh, winner ended up being an end-to-end -end trained method. And that's all I have.